Hello and welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here to talk about stuff this week on the show. Going to be a bit of a shorter episode as we're sort of between working on uh, different things right now. But we did want to get on to just do a a quick catch up, uh, have some fun at the top of the show. But also because there's been a couple of pieces of news this week that have been troubling and sad and things that I feel the need to rant about and don't want to hold off and let build up for multiple weeks in the future. Um, Is that a good summation, Sean? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were kind of eyeing this week to potentially do a, like, oh, we'll kind of take it off, and then, yeah, then a lot of stuff happened uh, in, in yeah. entertainment news. Yes. Um, including, did you see the Justice League trailer this morning, Sean? Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I watched it about 30 minutes ago, because I saw people were talking about that dumb movie on Twitter, and I'm like, oh, fuck, I have to watch that trailer before we do the podcast, huh? Mostly it's a good trailer. I was like, okay, this is fine. Like, it doesn't mean I'm going to think it's a great movie, but it's like, it's fine. If this, it, Honestly, if that had been like the first Justice League trailer ever, and there had been never been the Snyder Cut, there had never been the like trouble with the Joss Whedon version, any of that, I would have been like, this looks fine. And then at the end, Joker goes, we live in a society. And I, I, I wanted to go jump off a cliff. Yeah, and because that was the thing I had seen on Twitter was just people being like, hi, Joker in the trailer says we live in a society. And I was like, oh, that's probably, like, not on purpose. That's got to be a, like, dumb thing. And then I watched the trailer. It's like, no, that's 100% on purpose because he says we live in a society and then it pauses and hangs and then it cuts to the shot or whatever where he then says whatever. But so where people don't have honor, Batman. Yeah. And it's Jared Leto. Jared Leto's Joker is in it even though... You know, again, he would never have been in the version of Justice League that Zack Snyder was originally shooting. So I don't know what this project is, if it's supposed to be the Snyder cut of Justice League. <laughs> yeah, no, it's weird. I mean, he it's it's to the point where he says like the, the it's the kind of thing where the movie trailer like they do the main bulk of the trailer and then they finish and it fades to black. And then you hear Jared Leto go, we live in a society and then it fades back in. So it's it's the stinger. It's like Zack Snyder wanted you to know He's doing the meme. And it's just like, it's so funny because I thought that trailer mostly like put its best foot forward. It wasn't doing the fucking hallelujah music. Uh, It wasn't like rubbing your faces and things. It just was like a decent superhero movie trailer. Looked Mm -hmm. totally fine. And then at the end, it's like, no, 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 no. This is a trailer. This is a movie made possible by the internet. So we are going to make this an internet thing. (laughs) So Yeah. yeah. Anyway, not a main news thing today. I just thought we'd bring it up. Um, but Sean, how have you been uh, this this past week? I've been okay, you know. Uh, I did um, manage yesterday. I got my first dose of the vaccine, so that wow, yeah. So that that it was like a very sudden. Th- instead of sending an email to every single person employed by the district and saying, "Hey, if you go here, you might be able to get one in an hour." Um, it was they're like sending emails to like sort of as far as I can tell it's like more or less just like randomly selected hey there's this opportunity tomorrow would you be able to do it and I was like yeah sure um and so then I drove out at like six o'clock at night to for like it was like a 40 minute drive to some like place way out of the way um and it is currently fucking cold in Colorado it was four degrees last night it's currently zero degrees uh right now don't outside. tell me about cold shots <laughs> How cold is it over there? Negative five. Uh, and we That's have, not that much worse than what we're dealing with right now. We have not seen double digit weather at all any time of the day since before the last podcast recording. We have not been out of the... We've mostly been below zero uh, even during the day. It has been really bad. We've had a standing uh, National Weather Service alert to not go outside for more than 10 minutes because you will get frostbite because yeah, of wind so- chill. Yeah, that's basically what it was like last night and yeah. right now. Fucking cold. Um, and it was like a very... It was that thing where then I got there and it was like an hour-long wait. And it was just like, oh my god. And so, I i mean, I left to go there at like 5.40 and I didn't get back until 9 o'clock at night. Jesus. So it was a long process. Um, and it was that thing where you don't understand how it takes that long. Because then once I got to... Because it was basically like waiting in the line for over an hour. But then once I sat down... It was like one minute and there's like stick a needle in my arm, like go hang out in this waiting area for like 10 minutes to make sure that like you're not going to die from an anaphylactic shock because you didn't know that you were allergic. And it was like, I didn't. And it's like, okay, you can go. And, and then now I'll go back in like early March to get my second dose. 
Well, that's awesome. I'm I'm really glad that you know that's I that's one person in my life I can kind of like check off the list of like probably won't get COVID, <laughs> hopefully yeah. or at least protected. Um, but how how was it? Um, what's it like having a microchip from Bill Gates in your arm? You know, I I, I did wake up this morning and I just had a, a sudden um, urge to just buy Microsoft products. I don't know, um, but yeah, I mean it's it's I think uh, it's great. I'm glad to be on the uh, government register uh, that the aliens put into place. Um, I think it's great. I feel slightly bad even joking about this, but I don't I don't think we have any of those people listening to the podcast. In all serious no, in all seriousness though, have you noticed anything, or has it was it just like any other vaccine shot? No, it just like yeah, like a very slight soreness uh, when I woke up this morning around where the shot was taken, and that's it. Yeah, awesome, good to know, uh, and I'm glad I'm glad you and other teachers are getting vaccinated and that they have gone away from their Thunderdome approach, which I guess is what they were doing before, which is everyone come to this one spot and fight. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it it still is that thing where it's you just look at how just horrifyingly inefficient the, like the American healthcare system is. It's it makes no sense. Yeah, that like if you're like doing it by profession, why not just like stockpile enough vaccine and then create a team to go to individual schools or have teachers from like a certain section of schools go to one location at a similar time and yeah. just do it by that would be significantly more efficient than just some random here's some place in like the middle of nowhere or i like missed the turnoff to go into the building like twice because it was just <laughs> like it was like really like in the middle of nowhere like it was pitch black um and snowing um pretty heavily and i was just like where the fuck do i even go to get into this building i'm glad i left like 20 minutes earlier than i needed to um so it would have been nice if america wasn't just uh the worst in terms of healthcare stuff but yeah, no, I, uh, you know, we have lots of international listeners who who like to remind us of this. And yes, you know, we know you're you're all lucky. You live in, uh, you have socialized medicine. It's great. We need it. But yeah, anyway, um, well, that's good. Anything else going on? Uh, I I have well in my life. I'll just say I finished my exams, my comprehensive PhD exams. Uh, my last one was uh, on last Monday, so right after we recorded our last podcast, uh, and it went fine. So I've done all of that, and then it's just been. I have been in this weird phase, Sean, this last week where I have mostly just been like in a video game coma <laughs> because mm -hmm. I finished those exams and suddenly like my day, like all the study time of my day was just sort of gone. And I didn't, I don't immediately have anything to fill it with. I'm teaching, I'm working on that, but that is not a like all day, every day. In my case, it's, you know, it's one college class. It's a different kind of thing. Um, and I'm not yet, you know, heavy at work on my next project, whatever that will be, but my dissertation, I guess. Um, so I've just been playing way too much Genshin Impact, uh, and it has become somewhat unhealthy for me, I think. Um, because the last two nights I've been up at 3 a.m. to, like, check the daily thing when it starts. It's, it's a whole thing. It's a whole okay, thing. yeah, part, that's a lot. <laughs> part of that is because I'm just having trouble sleeping. But, like, anyway, uh, so yeah. You know, I'm I'm very stressed right now. I really want to get Zhao in Genshin Impact because those those motherfuckers at MiHoYo, they introduce this new character. They have a whole quest line where you get to play as him. He's clearly like the best character in the entire fucking game, and you have a 0.6% chance of drawing him. So I'm trying my best, but we'll see. Yeah, they do. I really really like that mission that sort of opens up the festival right event that they're doing because overall, I think that event is really cool. It's really um, good so yeah. far. I. I've done like the next part of the story and everything unlocked for me today, and I've mm -hmm. been doing that. It's it's very good. I, I have not, I've seen a couple of like these sort of little events like they've done, but this seems like one of the bigger like event kind of things with like all fully voiced and all that stuff. Yeah, this is basically the third time they've done a big event like this. The first one was the meteor shower event that they did, which was a lot of Mona and Fischl stuff, and that one was really good. Um, and then the biggest one they've done is when they added in Dragon Spine Mountain, and that was like a lot of stuff with Alvedo right. and all that. Um, and so yeah, so the, this is the third one they've done. Um, yeah, and it's it's really good. Um, and I think I like the way that they're pacing it out. That it feels like it's because it's taking place over the course of like three weeks or so, and they're like giving you that here's a little chunk of new stuff basically every day to check in and do a couple of these little quests, and then eventually here's like a bigger big story quest with a bunch of voice acting and stuff. Um, and then I've also gotten 
way more into the like tower defense thing they put in than I thought I would. It's really um, good. Yeah, it I, it was something where they announced ahead of time like these are the things that are going to be in our next big event this fe- this festival thing. And I saw a lot of it was like this looks really cool. They're putting Zhao in the game. He was really cool in the story and I really like his voice actor a lot. Um and then th- and they were like and there's going to be this tower defense thing. It's like, "Ah, oh, that's probably going to be whatever. I'll I'll play it a little bit to get the like rewards or whatever." Um, but then when it actually came out, I'm, I've been like shocked at how much fun I've had playing that because of how much it leverages the like elemental combat system really effectively. Um, and it's been fun putting together like a different team to run around in with that mode because you can't do any actual damage, but you can lay down elemental effects and that like will help you, you know, take advantage of the elemental combinations with the towers you put down. So that has been fun kind of looking at my team and thinking about the strategy of the elemental powers in a slightly different way. Um, and I've, yeah, I've just had a lot of fun uh, with that event over the past week. Yes, it's the Theater Mechanicus, I think is what they're calling it. And it's very mm-hmm. good. I, I, if you have not checked it out, it's very much worth it. I was playing it this morning. Very good stuff. Um, yeah, but mostly I just really, really want to get Zhao. I should, so I've done a bunch of research on like how the gotcha rolls work. I am totally eligible to possibly get a pity roll where you have a 50% chance of getting him. I just need to like keep rolling for it because it's basically after 89 rolls in the special events without a five-star character, they they give you the chance. And the two you can get are Jean or uh, Zhao. So... Fingers crossed I don't have to spend too much real money to get there. <laughs> but, um, because I have been, I had not, like, ever gone that deep in how the gotcha system works. And I realized I should have been saving up way more stuff than I have been. So, although I have unlocked a lot of characters in the last week. I got Fischl and I got, um, uh, Fire Rockstar Girl. I forget her name. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, I've gotten... Yeah, I've gotten a lot of characters in the last week. Not, not ones that I'm like necessarily actively using. Although I did get one who I was really excited about. I got, Sean, I got a really good roll. I got in the normal event, not the special event. I did a 10 roll where I got a 4-star weapon, a 5-star weapon, which is still my only one in the game. And uh, the character Sucrose, who is the wind girl, mm-hmm. uh, who I have wanted for a while since I trialed her earlier on. And I was like, oh, that because she's my first dedicated wind character outside the protagonist. So that's very nice. She's been useful. I've got her all leveled up and everything. So anyway, Genshin Impact is fun. Possibly also will destroy your life. Yes, yeah. Don't, don't, I'm going to say do not spend money to try to get a specific character. That is, that is always the thing you should not be doing on a uh, gacha game. Because that is, that is, that is the hole. That's how you get into the hole is yeah. when you're like, I need to have this character. Never have that mentality. No, um, you're right. You're right. Yes. And uh, and the the Jonathan who spent fifteen dollars a couple days ago agrees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just it's 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 that's that's where you just need to to back off. And, I know. Yeah, because he he seems like he's the hottest shit right now, but they're all, they're gonna put new characters into the game, and eventually you will get like the character that is your like hot shit character. Yeah. Um, and you don't have to spend a lot of money to do that. See, this is good. I'm talking to you, Sean, because uh, if people have to remember this is my first gotcha game. So there are all sorts of like uh, temptations I have, but but you are a you are a veteran, so you can guide me through this. You can be our shaman for for gotcha uh, uh, responsibilities and ethics. Yeah, and one thing that is nice about this event is that there are lots and lots of opportunities to get a decent amount of currency that you don't have to spend yes. money on. So it's like because I've got done like two rolls without like with just like the currency I've gotten so far through the event. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, I also should say in Genshin Impact in this last week, I finished the entire Liyue questline, and then the, the, the like, kind of epilogue thing, so I finished the entire, like, I guess what you would call the base game that they put in, um, because I think after Liyue, they, they have the event with Don's Leaf, um, mm-hmm. who is, uh, a yeah, character... Yeah, they, they added that in, like, a week ago. Oh, they that did? Is, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, like, right when they did the version 1.3 update. That's so funny. I just assumed that was, like, in there as, like, a preview early on because it felt like a very, like, natural next step. I had no idea it was new. Okay. Um, but I am very excited because eventually they're going to add him into the game, we know. Uh, mm-hmm. And he is voiced by Kenjiro Suda, who is Seto Kaiba in Yu-Gi-Oh! And he is um, uh, the villain in um, Sekiro. Not the... Not the like Ishin, but his nephew. Yeah, Genichiro. Genichiro. He's Genichiro. Uh, Kenjiro Suda is one of my like 
top 10 favorite Japanese voice actors. He has the coolest fucking voice. Like, if you only know English Yu-Gi-Oh, go watch some clips of Kenjiro Tsuda saying, Blue Eyes Quite the Dragon. And it is the coolest thing in the world. He makes, like, Kaiba and all of Yu-Gi-Oh significantly cooler than it otherwise would be. Um, and, and he is now in Genshin Impact, and I that is the character I need to have because he is Kenjiro Tsuda. <laughs> yeah, and and it's interesting that because he has done the voice for a bunch of trailers um, for like a long time on that game, so it's like they've it's the thing that when you you dig into stuff like I spent some time on like the Genshin Impact wikis, just looking up characters and getting lore because it's like they you know the fan base sort of takes all the different lore chunks that are in the random books and stuff and kind of compiles it together in ways that are easier to consume. And it's clear that they have, like, a really clear vision for a lot of the elements of the bigger story because they've been teasing that Dan's Life character forever, like, down to, again, having the voice actor narrate over trailers that came out before the, like, 1.0 launch of the game. Um, and it's, like, it was, like, very cool to have him finally actually enter the story. And I, yeah, I enjoyed that, just kind of wandering around with him. Um what uh, this is actually makes me curious. What um, gender did you pick for your main character? She's a girl. Okay, yeah. So I picked the male character. So in the the quest you go on with Daneslave, what gender does he refer to as his like adventuring partner from the past? A male. Okay, so it's a female for me. So yeah. Okay, so, that's so he's a, it's yeah, the I, twin. Yeah. yeah, I had assumed that it was your other twin, but I I wasn't sure um, if yeah because obviously yeah. It, would, it would change the voice line depending on what you picked. So yeah. yes. Um, and, and yes, I'm a girl named Sela. That is what I chose for my Genshin Impact girl. Um, and I'm glad about that. She, you know, she's a, she's a cool blonde girl, it, you know, and I'm a Gundam fan. It was very natural. Yes. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, Genshin Impact is great. I have also been playing, uh, the new Nintendo Switch game this week, which is Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury, which is a bit of a mouthful of a title, but is a game Every person who owns a Nintendo Switch needs to stop this podcast and go buy. It is a 100% must-own for that system because you get um, Mario 3D World, for those who don't remember, was the Wii U Mario game. There was there was the new Super Mario Bros. U game, which was the like fourth new Super Mario Bros. game. But in terms of the original 3D Mario game, it was Super Mario 3D World, which is the sequel to Super Mario 3D Land, which was the 3DS game. I'm a big fan of 3D Land. I think it's an amazing Mario game. 3D World, I think, is very good, like maybe a notch below for me, but I do like 3D World as well. Um, it was a Wii U game, so like you know, a certain number of people played it. Uh, and now it is on Nintendo Switch and, you know, a hundred times more people will play it if, if there is like, mm -hmm. uh, if there is a consistent arc here. Um, and it is a great game that people should play. It's a very accessible Mario game. It's a multiplayer Mario game. It's really, really good. Uh, and they have made actually significant improvements to it because you have online co-op with friends for the first time in any of these like Nintendo co-op games. So that's really cool. And that's a huge addition. Um, they've adjusted the movement speed Mario moved way too slowly in the original Wii U version uh, and you had to hold down Y to run and you just would hold it down all the time now his run speed is his normal speed and if you hold down Y he has another level of speed so that's a big adjustment um, there's animations they've added it's honestly like of all the different like games they've ported from the Wii U it's probably the one with the most like they're subtle but significant improvements um they could have called it Deluxe. For some reason, this is the one they didn't call Deluxe. Um, the only other one that they've called Deluxe that actually had significant new stuff was Mario Kart 8 because that added the whole battle mode and stuff. Um, but the other ones added nothing and were called Deluxe. This added a good amount, and it's a great game. But you also get Bowser's Fury. And Bowser's Fury, when they announced it, I had totally assumed that that would sort of be just a little, like, dumb minigame mode because... They, they've done this with a couple of other ports. So on the 3DS, they ported um, some of the Mario and Luigi games. And the first one, Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, they re-released that as Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga plus Bowser's Minions, which was this kind of dumb little like tactical minigame mode that was not very good and the story was not very good. And I think when they announced this, I'm like, oh, it's going to be something like that. And it's not. Bowser's Fury is the next 3D Mario game. Like, in the lineage of Mario 64, Sunshine, Galaxy, Odyssey, Bowser's Fury is the next one. It is not as big as those games, but it is a full-fledged new 3D Mario game. You know, full camera control, 
Mario moves. It's it's kind of a mix in mechanics between sort of Mario Odyssey and Mario 3D World because this is packaged with 3D World. It has a bunch of the 3D World assets and, and items and stuff in it. Um, but it is completely its own thing, and it is a fully open world Mario game where you are dropped into a big contiguous open world where you can basically after doing a couple things, go anywhere, and uh, all of the stars that you collect, which are cat shines, because it is all cat-themed, because it's it's Mario 3D World. That's when Mario got furry. I do love that they chose a title in Bowser's Fury that you can just very easily read or write as Bowser's furry, because he is. Um, but anyway, uh, in Bowser's Fury, so contiguous open world, like Mario Odyssey, all of the stars are just on the map, and when you get one, it doesn't like kick you back out to somewhere else. Um, but unlike Mario Odyssey, which is a series of separate worlds, this is all just one big contiguous open world. Uh, you even basically have a vehicle in Plessy the Dinosaur, who you just ride around on the ocean because it's a series of islands sort of on an ocean. Um, and it is, bar none, one of the best Mario games I've ever played. I've played all of them. Um, it is just a phenomenal new Mario game. I really hope they do a kind of like... It's kind of like Astro's Playroom, where I'm like, this is great, and they need to do the full $60 video game version of this. Same with Bowser's Fury. I hope this is the future of Mario, that they do... Because this basically feels like the natural evolution of Mario Odyssey, but also taking some really smart lessons from the 3D land and 3D world games, which are sort of like hybrid 2D, 3D Mario games. But the advantage of those games is they're the first ones to really try using a full power-up system like Fire Mario, Ice Mario, Tanuki Mario, Cat Mario, all of those in a 3D space. And all of the actual 3D games, like, the power-ups are just not really a thing. You've got, like, the wing cap in Mario 64. You've got the bee suit in Mario Galaxy. But, like, those are not the highlights of those games, and, and power-ups are not the focus. The 3D games uh, really... Uh, the 3D world and land games really make great use of power-ups, and that all carries up over into here. Um, it's got that Mario Odyssey quality of like really freely borrowing from 2D and 3D Mario uh, influences all over the map. It's it's just fantastic. It's honestly, Sean, the type of platformer that I feel like you would really love, especially given what we talked about with Astro's Playroom, that you kind of maybe prefer a more like concentrated, tight package. Because part of the fun is Bowser's Fury is it is this... You know, I've I've beat it at 50 stars, uh, which took probably three or four hours. Um, but I've got another 50 to do, so it's it's not insignificant, but it is like a more tight, compact package, and it is just a blast. There's like no, there's just no downtime in it. You're just moving and doing stuff, and it is so good, and it is kind of mind blowing that Nintendo made this and did this as like the big bonus for a Wii U re-release. It almost feels like maybe this was started development as like Mario Odyssey DLC, and then they were working on 3D World, and they kind of uh, retooled it. I don't know, but it is very, very cool. And you put that together with Mario 3D World, and this is a uh, this is one of the best things money can buy in video gaming right now. It's really good. So about how much, like how how long is Bowser's Fury? So there are a hundred stars to get. Uh, it takes 50 to beat the game. I beat the game in one day, but I probably played at least three hours in that day. So I would say to get the full 100, it's probably going to be in the like six to eight hour range, I would imagine, because the second 50 are always harder. Because mm -hmm. um, it's you've already gotten the low-hanging fruit. Um, so like a significant time investment. I mean, that's that's not as long as probably like your first playthrough of a Mario 64 or a Mario Galaxy, but it's longer than any 2D Mario game probably. Um, and certainly as a bonus to another game, it's very big, you know? If this were a standalone DLC, you'd say, wow, this is a significant, like, DLC expansion. Yeah, it's interesting just because it doesn't... It, I guess, like, I had never had a clear idea of what it was like, what Bowser's Fury was supposed to be before the game came out. Like, it just seemed like it was a, a weird add-on, but they didn't ever, like, feel like market it particularly effectively. Because, yeah, because I've heard from a lot of people now that it's really, really good. And I was like, really? I just thought it was like a multiplayer mode or something. It, I felt like they had kind of didn't get out there and kind of message what this was supposed to be like. Uh, I agree. I, I think the messaging was a little off because I didn't start to hear interesting things about it until like last week. Um, and it's actually less multiplayer <laughs> than the main game because the main game is a four-player 
uh, you can play as Mario, Luigi, Toad, and Peach, and you can have four people playing together. This is one player, and then Bowser Jr. is following you around, and you can give a controller to someone to do, like, certain things with Bowser Jr., but it's it's like the kid will play that with their parent, you know? Um, so it's just a big, dedicated single-player mode, and that is really cool. And, yeah, I don't know why Nintendo didn't, like, market it more heavily or effectively, because it's just... It's the next Mario game. Like, there's no other way to say it. And Very the, the cool. Yeah, and the Bowser's Fury part of the title is that the whole premise is that Bowser has grown extremely big, and he is angry, and every ten minutes or so while you're playing, he will go into, like, a Fury mode, and the map will change, and a bunch of shit will happen. Uh, and there's a bunch of stuff that you can only do during those times. But then each, like number of stars you've collected you do a big boss fight with bowser where you get a special big cat bell and become super saiyan cat mario which you've probably seen the pictures of and you are the same size as bowser and then you are doing a big boss fight with bowser on the entire open world map and i say on because like you are really big so you're like jumping over these levels you've already played it's really cool and i think they're the best bowser boss fights in any mario game because in most mario games back to the original 1985 game Bowser, you never fight directly. You sort of just, like, you jump under him. Or in Mario 64, you wait for him to do something, and then you go grab his tail. Uh, in Mario Galaxy, you wait for a pattern to end, and then you kind of you kick him when he's down. Um, in this, you actually are sort of empowered to, like, fight the motherfucker. And I'm like, this is... I don't know why this took 30 years, but I'm glad. It's really fun. So, yeah. You no, know, they just had to rip off Sonic the Hedgehog. That's all it took. It is very Sonic the Hedgehog. Also, when Bowser is in his fury mode... I 100% believe that someone told the musicians, the composers, we want One Winged Angel but for Bowser, because that is 100% what the music is. It's not as good as One Winged Angel, but like, go look this track up, like, try to find video of it or something, because it is like a choir over like big heavy instruments doing like Bowser's version of One Winged Angel. It does, like, on like the big stings, does the choir just like belt out the name Bowser? They might. It's it's hard to know what they're saying, but there is definitely a, a choir doing stuff. Because that yeah. is, to me, that is like the key ingredient of One Winged Angel is you have the choir just say the name of the boss um, yes. over and over and over again. Yes. All right. Um, let's see. So so that's what I've been up to. Do you have anything else to tell us about Sean? Um, I did. I finished uh, Yakuza Six, which I I had kind of been holding off on playing the last chapter until I had a contiguous four hour chunk of time um, to play it. Which the only time I had that last week was when we uh, watched Batman Forever. Um, so you know that was watching Batman Forever was definitely a much better use of my time than finishing Yakuza Six. Uh, but yeah, so a couple of days ago, I guess on Friday, I, I finished it, and it's very very good. Um, the ending is great. It has, it does a thing that I think is very, very Yakuza, um, where it sort of has, it, it has an ending that you, where it's kind of a little bit of a fake out ending and it cuts to credits and then it, like halfway through the credits, it's like, here's the real ending. Um, it's like, it, it's, I would call it a post credit sequence, but it's about 15 to 20 minutes long, which I don't think you can say it's a post credit sequence at that point. Uh, because it's more of a, like, they use the credits as, like, a narrative device to, like, create a break, basically, in the ending that's very dramatic. Um, but that whole post credit sequence is incredibly good. Um, they, they really bring the themes of this game specifically about not just fatherhood, but grandfatherhood of, um, you know, having your children grow to adults and sort of seeing them off um, and, like, seeing them off, like, being able to create their own family. Um, and so the themes of that for Yakuza 6 and then some of the larger themes around Kiryu's character that have persisted for most of the games, they just find like really powerful spots to sort of like really hit those notes. Um, they do some really great stuff with um, Daigo, who is a major character introduced in 2, who's sort of Kiryu's successor in the Tojo clan that Kiryu kind of sets up um, as his successor over the course of Yakuza 2 and 3. Um, and they bring his character in in that kind of ending and do some really good stuff with him. And then the last, like, five minutes is just completely killer. Like, it, it is clear that they had a really great idea. It feels like it was almost like their idea for what the last, like, c cinematic sequence of the game was, was, like, they had that vision, and they're like, how do we make a game that leads up to this, like, sequence of interconnected shots? Because it's just, like, the editing and everything is so fucking good. Um, and, like, the kind of beat that they'd use to sort of, like, send off 
Kiryu as the protagonist of these games is is like absolutely perfect. So, um, Yakuza Six, very good. I, I I got like weirdly emotional at the end of it, feeling like you know obviously there's still Yakuza Seven to play, but with this being the end of Kiryu's story, it's this thing where I've been playing these games since January 2017 and like barreling through these, and it made me like think back to one of my my most distinct memories around Yakuza Zero was right around when I started playing that game is when I went to the Denver Metro campus to um, have a meeting to like see what credits I had that would transfer over and all that stuff to get into the teacher license program. And I have a very distinct memory of getting there um, a little bit early before I had my meeting with an advisor and walking around that campus listening to the Yakuza Zero soundtrack. And it is weird to feel like, fuck like how how much has changed like over the course of me playing these games because it is very much that kind of ending that is making kind of like reflect on things um in your own life so yaks is great yaks is six is great it's i would say if you're putting all of these games together including judgment i would say yaks is zero is the best one judgment would be the second best but i would say yaks is six to me is the third best of um all of these games again not having played seven yet um, or any of like the weird like samurai spinoffs and stuff. That's awesome. That's really cool to hear. I had been really excited to hear what you thought of the ending because I feel like whenever Yakuza Six came out, it got kind of like muted reception in the U.S. or like wasn't like paid a ton of attention to. And I'd seen some conflicting opinions, and I was just wor- like c- c- uh, curious what Sean was going to make of it. And it sounds like it was very good. So I yeah. am excited about that. I think it's the kind of thing where if you didn't play all the games, it doesn't. It's not going to have like the emotional oomph in the ending. And I think that's part of what happened with six. Was I think there were a lot of people who played zero, and then played six because six came out over here like six months after zero came out over here. So yeah. I think it's like if you you can get some of that impact, but um, particularly a lot of the stuff in the ending, specifically that ending fifteen minutes or so, you need that like have spent time with all of these characters to. Um, have that that kind of emotional resonance because it is very much a like it's like not a season finale it's a show finale right it has that kind of feel right. to it um where you've spent so much time with all these characters especially if you were someone who started playing the fucking ps2 ones um i can't even imagine like how if you were a fan since then i think that that, that ending would hit for you very hard awesome well that's really cool to hear um all right well should we dive into the news yeah, what's going on in the news, Jonathan? All right, my first news item is called The Whole Joss Whedon Thing. Uh, yeah. But I do have an outline written here. So let me go through like the basics of the news to like lay it down, and then we will react. Uh, so this week, uh, Charisma Carpenter, who played Cordelia on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel, detailed a history of abusive behavior on the sets of both shows by creator Joss Whedon, calling him casually cruel and someone who created, quote, hostile and toxic work environments since his early career. She related stories of him fat-shaming her during her pregnancy, berating her for a tattoo, tried pressuring her into aborting a pregnancy, forced her to work extra-long hours against doctor's orders late in her pregnancy, leading to Braxton Hicks contractions, and fired her one season after giving birth, leading to her abrupt departure from Angel, which has long been a product of uh, speculation. Uh, She also detailed him disparaging others, openly bullying and pitting cast and crew against each other, and more. This all comes a year after Ray Fisher, who played Cyborg in Justice League, came out with accusations of abusive behavior against Joss Whedon, um, which have not been publicly detailed because there have been investigations internal to WB that Ray Fisher has been participating in. Uh, Details of the internal WB investigation have not been made public, but did lead to Whedon being fired from the upcoming HBO show The Nevers, which was going to be his first sort of um, foray back into television in a number of years. Um, Ray Fisher, however, was also fired, from his job at WB last month, from additional appearances as Cyborg, including in the upcoming Flash movie, in a move widely believed to be retaliatory, retaliatory, and which Carpenter, who participated in the investigation, cites as her immediate reason for coming forward now. Uh, Since Carpenter's statement, additional accusations have been made by Amber Benson, who played Tara on Buffy, who backed up accusations of a toxic environment, and who was also notably killed off suddenly from the series. Uh, Writer Jose Molina, who was a writer on Firefly, backed up these uh, 
uh, uh, accusations, particularly the idea that uh, Whedon is a cruel person um, who felt, quote, being mean was funny and enjoyed, quote, making female writers cry during notes sessions, even boasting about a time he made a writer cry twice in one meeting. Uh, and Michelle Trachtenberg, who played Dawn, the little sister on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, who was an underage girl during the series, uh, backed up Carpenter and reported that there was a rule saying that Whedon was not allowed a room in a room alone with her during production on the series. Sarah Michelle Geller, James Marsters, Eliza Dushku, and Anthony Stewart Head have all voiced support for the accusers. So that is where we are as of now. Um, for whatever reason, Joss Whedon is still like represented by his agency um he has not responded to any of this uh there has not been additional fallout he's not working on anything at the moment so there's nothing for him to be fired from but uh yeah this is bad and he needs to, it it just needs to be the the state of things that he has never allowed on a movie set again this is terrible terrible stuff and one of the things that's like really frustrating about it is that like this this is not the first time that information has come out specifically about Joss Whedon in this context because it was a few years ago, right? That it was it was it his ex wife. Yes. Um, so yeah, it was around 2017 because it was also around the time of Justice League being produced that uh, his ex wife detailed in a statement that he was. Um, I mean, the headline was that he was a serial cheater uh, and adulterer. Which, on its own, is one thing, but she also detailed in there some pretty creepy behavior from him and statements like that he would tell her, hey, I'm surrounded by all these young girls on set, what do you expect me to do? Like, that kind of stuff that sounded pretty predatory. Um, but we didn't have a ton more than that until the Ray Fisher stuff, and... The Ray Fisher stuff was interesting because because of those investigations, Fisher was not like detailing it publicly. But I mean, there was a lot of smoke there because the entire cast of Justice League was on his side. Like they voiced support. Um, I think one reason why the Zack Snyder cut stuff came together maybe as fast as it did is I think there seems like there's a pretty strong sense of solidarity among that cast in really disliking Joss Whedon uh, and liking Zack Snyder, who we shit on his movies. I've never heard a single word against Zack Snyder as a person. It seems like he's a very nice guy to work with. Uh, and, and clearly that counts for a lot because otherwise he would not be making this fucking director's cut. Um, but yeah, it's... There's, there's been a lot of a lot of smoke, and this is very, very direct evidence of fire, as was the, the WB investigation that led to his firing from the HBO show. Yeah, yeah, it's just has been this thing where it, it's felt like for a while now, Joss Whedon, like, at least like in my head, Joss Whedon has been on the shit list for, for quite some time, but it never felt like more publicly that that's caught on for whatever reason. Um, and so this, it feels like maybe this is finally like now people more broadly pay attention to this, like, yeah, no, like, fuck this dude. Um, he made some really good stuff. Like, you can still like Buffy. You can still like Angel. Like, I like those shows. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, it's it's nice to see that's like, this thing that feels like I, I never really understood why the Joss Whedon stuff never was catching on when you'd get little bits and pieces of it. Um, so, hopefully, this, like, actually really sticks to him. Um, because, yeah, it's particularly, it's that you have to wonder what the mindset is for people making a tv show when you have to have a rule that says that the showrunner is not allowed to be in a room alone with an underage actress like i kind of feel like if you're in a situation where you have to make that rule you're kind of in a situation where you have to fire that motherfucker right like that should be that should be what it is right that should be how you deal with that is not we have to make a rule so that people feel safe we should get rid of the person that you would have to make that fucking ridiculous rule for in the first place yeah, there shouldn't be that rule because the person who it would impact shouldn't be employed. Yeah. Like, for a million reasons. It's incredible. And, like, I, what a lot of this also says to me is that there are a lot of shoes left to drop. Um, mm -hmm. Like, this is not going to be the end of this story. And yeah, there have been enough people coming forward from different corners and whatnot that I just, I have to imagine there's a lot more here. Um, and yeah, you know, and like all the stuff that he did to Charisma Carpenter, I mean, that is like, not that this kind of stuff does not happen now, but that is like the kind of stuff you hear about actresses who acted in like the forties and had to deal with, you know, mm -hmm. and like 
it is like a Hollywood history thing that we naively think we're past and we're obviously not past, but we should be past. I mean, it is really, really bad stuff. And also like everyone loved Chris Carpenter on Buffy and Angel. And I know there's long been a lot of consternation about what the fuck happened that she wasn't in the last season of Angel. And, and I have not seen Angel all the way through, but I know like from people who've watched it that it's like a very sudden departure that made very little sense. And this kind of fills in those gaps in the in the worst way possible. Yeah, and it definitely, it's the, because I think it's the penultimate season of Angels when they do a bunch of weird stuff with Cordelia's character. Um, that, like, it, I have not seen that show since I was in high school, so, like, my memory of it is very vague at this point. But I always remember, like, like, I like Angel quite a bit as a TV show, but there was some stuff with Cordelia in that season, which is the season when she was pregnant, that is, like, really weird. Um, and I imagine if you went back and watched it now, knowing this stuff, it probably feels particularly weird. Some of the stuff they do with the fact, like, the character is pregnant and, like, some stuff of how they deal with that feels off. Um, and then, yeah, then my memory is, is also that then, like, the characters just sort of shuffled off at the end of that season. And it feels like it just doesn't feel, like, organic to the story that had been told um, up to that point. Yeah. And, you know, you said this, that obviously if you are a fan of those shows or Firefly or whatever, you can still be a fan of those. And that's true. But I, I do want to push for, I think, for a while, like, independent of accusations against him, there has probably needed to be a critical reevaluation of the Joss Whedon oeuvre of especially, like... And I think the really kind of dark, fucked-up way where, for a time there was a big segment of the media and fandom that read feminism through the lens of this white dude and like his work. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people were kind of raised on that. And there are interesting ideas through a feminist lens in Buffy and there are really problematic ones. Uh, and that's true in Angel and it is true in Firefly and it is really, really true in Dollhouse. Um, and like, that doesn't mean you have to reject it all out of hand, but like, you know, I, I do think, and I think I've been getting the sense for a while, um, you know, I will say one moment that, like, really shifted my thinking on a lot of, like, viewing certain, like, male auteurs and their views towards women was when all the Louis C.K. stuff happened really forced me to kind of rethink how I had seen, I mean, it forced everyone to because it's very clear that, like, he was putting a lot of his bad behavior into that show and, like, kind of rubbing it in everyone's faces, but we had been trying to, like, read it in a different way. And then it forces you to kind of reevaluate and see a lot of like performative feminism and a lot of like using women as shields against men's bad behavior. And I think there is, when you go back and look, I think there's quite a bit of that in Buffy. And I think there's a lot of that in Firefly and Dollhouse. Um, and I think, you know, Avengers Age of Ultron um, has been picked apart very well by smarter people than me uh, about its problems with its female characters. Um, or character, uh, Scarlet Witch, uh, not Scarlet Witch, uh, Scarlet Widow. There is also Scarlet Witch, but she's not a prominent character in that movie. Um, you know, so I, I just think there's a lot that kind of, you know, should be reevaluated. Death of the author is not an actual thing. Um, <laughs> if, if you know the author did these things, and, and, and it is important to say he is not the sole author of any of these things. And, you know, you could still say, Sarah Michelle Geller gave a titanic, amazing, genre-defining performance in Buffy, and that has not changed 1% by anything Joss Whedon did, right? Yeah, but and I, that also, specifically with it being a TV show, like, there are large, like, even more so than a movie, you have a large team of writers and directors, right. uh, and obviously actors and everybody else working on the show as well. But yeah, I agree that there's... There, I think it's been, a, like, a kind of a long time coming in a reevaluation of a lot of that stuff, particularly... Buffy, Angel, like, and and uh, Firefly as well, like that sort of era when it felt like he was the kind of like the hot shit in terms of like nerdy TV, um, and kind of defined a lot of nerd culture in the '90s and early 2000s. Um, but but like the great work that other people did on those shows shouldn't have to be tainted by that fuckwad. It shouldn't be tainted, and part of the reevaluation should also be seeing how Whedon sold. And fans helped him sell a really auteur brand through this stuff where everything, even though these are big TV shows, um, 
are reduced to the one guy, right? And this mm-hmm. is something, um, you know, Charisma Carpenter talks about, I think, too, in, in hers, and that people have talked about now, is that, like, you know, she is suffering for this art, like, very directly, and someone else is taking credit. Uh, this also came up again this week because we got this big profile of Shelley Duvall, uh, who played Wendy Torrance in The Shining and the shit Stanley Kubrick put her through, and how that is a case of the male auteur getting credit for the female's, like, genuine like pain and suffering for the art um and you know i think these are all things to reconsider you know like whedon could have been out there like uh for instance vince gilligan who who did breaking bad and and co-runs better call saul any interview with vince gilligan he will be the first to lay praise on a million people i have heard him on a million podcasts say he hates he says the french have given us many good things and auteur theory is the worst thing they've ever given us like he's someone out there like being like no, I'm not an auteur. This is not like, this is a collaborative medium. Collaboration is everything, blah, blah, blah. Joss Whedon was not that guy. And like, yeah. there, there is something to be suspect about that when someone pushes, especially in a medium this collaborative, a singular vision of control uh, that they want to be associated with. Uh, and it, it, it should lead to a higher level of screening. It doesn't mean everyone who does that is bad, but it's something to scrutinize. Um, you know... I it's it's been a weird time because so Avengers Age of Ultron was 2015 um and I think it is significant he has not made a movie since then he has not released a TV show since then the only thing is Justice League which he reshot but his name is not director on that he's an executive producer and co-writer on that film in its I mean he did direct the theatrical version we know but like DGA rules and stuff um and I do wonder when I say there's other shoes to drop I think part of it is you don't make Avengers and Avengers Age of Ultron and then not work for five years by accident, if mm-hmm. you know what I mean. Like, something had to be going on persistently with him in productions that I feel like would lead to a general resistance to hire him for stuff and that we were only now getting this HBO show he was going to do. And, I mean, it is super weird. HBO right now is marketing this big fantasy show from Joss Whedon and they, they're not using his name in it. And that is, uh, you know, that's 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 crazy and says a lot about how bad this shit is. Uh, and how bad, like, HBO knows it is because they have the WB internal investigation that we don't have. Right, yeah. Um, because they were they had pulled his name off of it before the Carpenter stuff came out. So they knew this was coming. And I, and I do think maybe there is also something gross about them not making any of that public. But we will see. Yeah, we'll see. It's you know, it's far from done of like shitty dudes in media. Um, yeah. That hopefully, you know, again, it's that thing you always have to remind yourself when this shit comes out that it's like it is good that it is coming out, even if it like makes you feel like shit because you think about now because yeah. now you know how bad it was for a lot of people. Um, but it's good yeah. that we're that that this information is getting out there. You know, and speaking of Ray Fisher, who is so brave and heroic in all of this, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, it is one reason I actually am planning on and interested in watching the Snyder Cut of Justice League is it sounds like he was very invested in that character of Cyborg and that he and Snyder had a plan. Like, he and Snyder have said many times, and I don't know if this is true, but they've said many times that they really felt like he was, like, the key point-of-view character of that film in their version. And I think part of Ray Fisher's frustration is, like, apparently, like, there are no scenes from the Snyder version uh, with Cyborg in that. All of his stuff was completely reshot by Whedon. And it was really bad, as we all know, in the theatrical cut. That version of Cyborg, just, there's nothing there. And Cyborg is a cool character who you could do a lot with. And, you know, I am, I feel like I want to give the chance to, like, see that work in whatever form it was originally in. And see what, what they were planning, because... Uh, I, I am pro cyborg getting cool stuff to do in movies. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I'm curious about that. That's tangentially related to the Joss Whedon stuff, but just something I've been thinking about. Yeah. I just wish that it wasn't going to be four hours. That's, yeah. 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 Because mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I, 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 I love the cyborg character. I, I, I mean, <laughs> particularly from the Teen Titans comic, but, or the Teen Titans cartoon, but also some of the stuff in the comics. Um, but it's like, please, could, could we have like a, like, the opposite of the like extended edition version for whatever they're doing with the Snyder cut. So I can get like a two and a half hour movie at max. Just, I, don't want to I, I guess we'll, I will watch I'm it curious. in chunks. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. Um, all right. The other story this week uh, was the Gina Carano story. 
So uh, Gina Carano, who played the the person, I don't remember their name, on uh, uh, The Mandalorian, the Star Cara Wars Dune. show. Cara Dune. She played Cara Dune on The Mandalorian. You want to she... know a random Star Wars character's name? I am your guy. Yep. You just ask me and I remember that shit, even though there's no reason to. All right, Cara Dune, uh, Gina Carano, she has been disinvited from future Star Wars productions by Lucasfilm. I think it is important to say disinvited. People are saying fired. She was not fired. She was not under contract for anything. She is just, basically, Lucasfilm said, hey, John Favreau, don't write her in anything. We're not using her anymore. And then they, they made a public statement, we're not working with her anymore. So I do think the language matters there. She has been disinvited from future Lucasfilm productions. After comparing a conservative in, being a conservative in Hollywood to being a Jew in the Holocaust, and after a string of similarly anti-Semitic, blatantly anti-trans, and conspiratorial posts over the last year, a problem which we have been learning has been sort of a bubbling issue for Lucasfilm, which was ready to give her her own television series in uh, the, the New Republic show they were going to do, and finally she just stepped on it one too many times and tanked her own career now there are a number of ways to approach this sean and you know for me this is pretty simple uh disney is a company with an image they would like to maintain gina carano is out there being a raging anti-semite yeah they have the right not to work with her if they don't want to that is as american as apple pie i think it's a pretty simple story then there is another layer to this story though that i want to talk about but i guess let's just start with the simple of did disney do the right thing here Yes. Yeah. No. I mean. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Fire her, please. Thank you. You know, we didn't. We didn't talk about this in the context of Mandalorian season two when we reviewed it. Frankly, she's a pretty minor figure in that season. Um, and I really didn't know how to talk about it because it's this Twitter shit and it's memes and, I mean, it really. I feel like it ramped up after that season wrapped but i wasn't paying close attention to it i don't I, i'm not as online a person as maybe it seems uh, especially in this kind of stuff um but it's really bad and you know i think an extra wrinkle here is pedro pascal who is essential to the mandalorian he is the mandalorian uh -huh. um his sister is trans and and she just came out as trans and pascal who is a very openly progressive person was celebrating her online and, and encouraging her and and it was a really beautiful thing and you know it's also just an HR thing are you really going to ask Pedro Pascal to step on set with someone who does not view his sister as human uh, you know this is this is pretty cut and dry shit and frankly I don't think it should have taken this long for Disney to cut those ties anybody could play Cara Dune Cara Dune is not the most, like, interesting character on The Mandalorian. I don't think she's a bad character or anything. But, like, the show can go on. And, and you know, Disney will tolerate a lot, very clearly. But, you know, yeah. If you compare yourself to being a Jew in the Holocaust and you are in any situation other than an act of genocide, I think you probably should be fired from your job. I do. I am okay with that. I am okay with that statement. Yeah. And, and like you, Jonathan, I was not... I'm like particularly aware of of the stuff that she talked about online before this point. So it's like I was not really aware that there was like stuff before this until this happened. And it was like, oh shit, okay. Um, so yeah, like I wish I had had known more so we could have talked about it more on the Mandalorian season two stuff. Although, like you said, she's not like it's that thing of where people have been like, are they going to recast the character? Not recast the character? And this is one where I'm like, I mean, you can because she's not that important, but also like. I like you don't really need to because the character is so relatively minor. Like she, I like I enjoyed the character in seasons one and two of Mandalorian, but I don't like have a burning desire to see the future adventures of Cara Dune specifically. I more just want to see other Star Wars shows. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's the right way to put it. Um, so, so okay, so this is this is pretty simple. Um, Lucasfilm did the right thing. Maybe they did it too late, but like I feel like if you're gonna draw a line in the sand. Comparing yourself to being a Jew in the Holocaust is a good line to draw. I think we, I would hope we can all agree on that. But we yeah. can't all, but we can't all agree on that. And here's the thing, Sean. When anything like this happens, I expect, and I have it priced in in my mind, that there will be conservative dipshits on Twitter like Ben Shapiro and other pieces of garbage like that who will come out and cry about free speech and wet their pants and pretend to be very mad about it and all of that. 
And I don't care because those people are charlatans and they are con artists and nothing they say is genuine and they do not matter. However, when liberals and people in the center or people who should just fucking know better pretend to take that as like serious and like, oh, this is a serious concern, I get really pissed off. And I don't think I have been as angry reading Twitter in the last long time as I was this week in seeing a post, there's an article and then tweets by a guy named Jonathan Shate, who is a well-known dipshit, but this was what really angered me was people who really should know better, people I respect and like listen to on a daily basis, like Chris Hayes from MSNBC, sharing this and agreeing with it. And it was the opinion that the Gina Carano situation is bad, actually, because she is being fired because she is conservative. Uh, and this is basically the same as the Hollywood blacklist of the 40s and 50s. Uh, and now Hollywood is just deciding a blanket statement of they're just not hiring conservatives anymore. And that is really chilling and bad for free speech. Um, that is the stupidest thing I have ever read on the internet. Yeah, that is there, a there's a lot of dimensions to how stupid it is. Can I go into some of them? Yeah, go ahead. All right, for people who don't know what the blacklist is, and I, okay, so I am a film historian. I really, in, I enjoy history in all forms. I, I think much more historically than I do theoretically in kind of the academic parlance. Uh, and I think history is very important. And I think film history is really important because film history intersects with a lot of the major events of the 20th century. Uh, and certainly if you want to understand the building of mass media, which is very important, you have to understand your film history. One of the single most important events in film history in the United States is the Hollywood blacklist. But it is not just film history. This is not movie trivia. This is something that also is just a piece of American, like, governmental, societal history. Uh, because this starts in the 1940s with the Red Scare, which if you don't know the name Joseph McCarthy, go look it up. Joseph McCarthy is the U.S. senator who alleged... Uh, widespread communist infiltration at all levels of American society. He would stand up with a list of names on the floor of the Senate uh, and say, I have a list here of, of known communists and we got to do something about them. This led to things like HUAC, which is H-U-A-C, uh, the House Un-American Activities, Activities Committee, which was a congressional committee that dragged people via subpoena uh, who were uh, suspected of being communists in front of the House and they were forced to answer the question, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And they would have to uh, say yes or no. And if it was yes, they would have to publicly recant and name names to avoid basically jail time. Um, this intersects with Hollywood when 10 writers and directors, now known as the Hollywood 10, are dragged in front of HUAC in 1947 and they refuse to answer questions. They basically plead the fifth, which is their god-given fucking right under the american constitution uh, against self-incrimination uh, and they refuse to answer questions uh, and they are jailed for a year um, one of these men is dalton trumbo who has a personal connection uh, to the people on this podcast because he lived in boulder colorado and there is a statue of dalton trumbo and the trumbo fountain at cu boulder he is a a celebrated alumni there um, and also one of the great screenwriters of hollywood history the blacklist is really broken because uh, Dalton Trumbo writes the movie Spartacus, the Stanley Kubrick, Kirk Douglas movie. Um, he does it under a pseudonym, uh, and then it is revealed that he actually did it and is granted credit eventually, and that is what breaks the blacklist uh, later on. But this is the Hollywood 10. They're, they're dragged in front of Congress, all this stuff. They're jailed. After they are jailed, the studio executives uh, from all the major Hollywood studios, so your Warner Brothers, your Fox, Disney, all those people, they get together at the Waldorf Hotel. And there's a significant event that happens on December 3rd, 1947, it's called the Waldorf Statement, where they draft a statement, a collusion statement among all these studios to say they will refuse to employ any actual or suspected communists, which creates the blacklist, which is a, a, an official deal agreement between studios to refuse to employ anyone they suspect of being a communist. And that is a broad definition, because if you haven't noticed, Americans aren't very good at nailing down what a communist is and isn't. Um, this is kind of a historical trend in America. And so, really, it's an excuse to fire anyone um, with any leftist intentions kind of whatsoever. Um, it is very bad. It gets out of hand very fast. Um, 
you know, so this is an official hiring blacklist. Um, throughout this period, you have HUAC continuing to go on. You have um, friendly versus unfriendly witnesses. You have a lot of people in Hollywood who I would say forever shame themselves by going in front of HUAC and naming names. They out uh, other people in Hollywood who they say are communists or suspect of being communists. Some of them are, some of them, most of them are not. Um, you have people like On the Waterfront's director and writer, uh, Elia Kazan and Bud Schulberg, respectively, both go name names. They become sort of pariahs from it. On the Waterfront is a allegory uh, that is trying to defend their own point of view. The movie becomes much less fun when you view it through that lens. Um, Walt Disney went and named names. Um, there were lots of people. Ronald Reagan oversaw a lot of this and frankly came to political prominence through the blacklist because he was the head of SAG, the Screen Actors Guild at the time, and he was militant in trying to drive communism out of Hollywood, and he spearheaded a lot of these efforts, and he named all sorts of names in front of HUAC. And remember, if you went and named a name in, at HUAC, that person would either be dragged in front of HUAC and recant and name names themselves, or they would be blacklisted from ever working in the industry again. Um, the, the heights of this are so extreme, Sean, that we kicked Charlie Chaplin out of America. Charlie Chaplin, who at one point, uh, this has been like proven historically was the most famous person on planet earth in like a pre-world war ii world he was the most like recognizable face on the planet yeah in 1952 he made a trip to britain and the fbi took away his passport and visa refused to ever let him enter the country again his wife had to go back and get their shit and they eventually wound up in switzerland uh, and they never came back to the united states except once chaplin was finally able to come back to accept a lifetime achievement oscar very late in his life uh yeah we kicked charlie chaplin out of america we deported him during this yeah and it's, sean it's... can you can you explain the problems with comparing this to the gina carano situation in case it's not fucking clear enough I mean, oh my God, there's I mean too many. I mean, one is I'll, I'll just say you know if, like the the one of the most famous works um, about this period of American history and this particular dynamic is the play The Crucible, which yes. you know is a play about the Salem witch trials, um, which that that is a more uh, apt comparison of the historical witch trials than uh, Disney deciding to fire Gina Carano for being publicly racist and anti-Semitic. Yeah. Which, yeah. yeah, like, like it's like, I don't even know where or how you say, like, where you actually start to break down how these two situations are dissimilar, because there are no similarities. There's just not. I mean, one huge one is that the government's not involved in it. Like, that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's a pretty massive, massive fucking difference that uh, really recolors the whole thing. And really, for me... What is most frustrating about this, and this is like a broad trend in American politics um, and why our country is fucked, um, is that our country and basically every facet of our country in terms of like figures that hold tremendous power, whether they are political figures or they are private enterprise figures, like the people who make the choices about whether or not to hire someone like Gina Carano, um, those people are conservatives, right? The country is run by people who are on the right because they're rich people and rich people are on the right politically because by being on the right, they maintain their power and their influence. So it is like a really weird thing to see people like politically shoot themselves in the head basically by accusing this whole buying into this weird conspiracy theory that is also in and of itself anti-Semitic because it comes from like fundamentally this like the conspiracy theory that the Jews run Hollywood, right? Like that's where all this comes from. Um, when, like, in reality, it is conservatives firing Gina Carano because they want to have more money and they see her as a figure that is not, like, can't be used publicly because most normal people don't like racists and anti-Semites. That's just a thing that's generally true. Rich people don't give a fuck because they don't have a heart. Um, but most people don't enjoy racists and don't want to watch someone who is, like, publicly outed as being, like, a horrible anti-Semite in their TV shows for their entertainment. But the people making this choice aren't doing it for political reasons. It's never been done for political reasons. If they were doing it for political reasons, they would have fired Gina Carano before fucking... They probably would never have hired her for Mandalorian based on how far some of the stuff goes back if you actually read into it. Or certainly not for fucking bring her back for season two of The Mandalorian. And so it's, it's this really frustrating thing where you get people who are center or, like a little bit left of center in American politics, buying into this whole ridiculous, again, fundamentally anti-Semitic conspiracy that the right 
brings up time and time and time again about how quote unquote the left controls the media when the when the media is controlled by billionaires who are not leftists yes there is there's nuance here you know many people who work in media are left of center but yeah, the people like a lot who, of the creative figures are for sure yeah but the people who write the checks are not like i don't know about kathleen kennedy she's in a weird like in between space of being both an executive and a creative because she's the producer overseeing lucasfilm but like you know bob Iger. i actually don't know the name of the current disney ceo but bob Iger was ceo until very recently at disney He's a conservative. Like, I don't think he is actively out there contributing to political campaigns, to my knowledge. But, like, you know, he's a rich dude who doesn't want to be taxed. He's conservative. And, you know, whatever. That's his right. That's that's the right of anyone to be whatever political denomination they want to be. I, there are so many problems, and we'll get back to the blacklist comparison. But part of this, and I think this is another way America is fucked right now, Sean, is people just assuming, like, being anti-Semitic is a political stance. It's right, not. Yeah. Like, I agree, you should not be fired from your job for your political stances. If your political stance is, I think there should be a lower marginal tax rate, it would be lunacy to fire someone for that, right? Or or whatever, you know, or like, yeah. I, I thought the Iraq war was good. Well, that's a dumb idea, but y you have a right to work if you think the Iraq war is good. If you think Jews control the world and that you are in the same position as a Jew in the Holocaust... No, you maybe don't deserve to have that job. Like, that's not a political opinion. And yes, there is this really dark moment we are in where those opinions are being increasingly conflated with the Republican Party, which is a white nationalist terror group, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But conservatism is different. And like, this is something to understand. Like, there are conservatives all over the world, and many of them are not Republicans. There are conservatives in the Democratic Party, right? Like, party and political ideology are two very different things. And if you're saying, like, oh, she's fired for being a conservative, no. She was fired for being a lunatic. But, like, there is no, like, piece of, like, conservative political philosophical writing that says to be a conservative you have to hate Jews and trans people. That's just, these are separate things, right? And it's one of the fucked things about America that the Republican Party is so out there and, and nuts that, like, because of basic pieces of identity, you know, like gay people and trans people and 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 immigrants and black people and and so many segments of American life, basically if they did have conservative beliefs have no expression for that because the one party that like is trying to represent them doesn't let them in the door, right? And that is one of the fucked up things about American life. But it is important to understand the difference in like conservatism, progressivism, liberalism. These are not the same as democrat and republican, right? And yeah, so, but no. What Gina America has, yeah, what America has done politically, um, and it's been like our whole lifetime has this been happening, but like very specifically with Donald Trump, this like just became what it is, is that movement from things that were policies and beliefs in the Republican Party forever, you know, the, the modern version of the Republican, the Republican Party forever, but were unspoken, um, then started being spoken. And now we are at the point where like, there are people who seem like they should be reasonable people that are like allowing the notion that anti-Semitism is like a part of conservative politics because Republicans are anti-Semites and white supremacists, um, generally speaking. Like you're allowing those things to be conflated and then saying that it's like, well, then this becomes a valid political opinion in the way that like we allowed like disbelieving in evolution to be a valid political opinion or like believing that global warming is like fake to be a valid political opinion where it's like we're taking things that are just like categorically false or categorically morally wrong and allowing those things to be legitimized by attaching them to like broad ideologies and saying like well you should be allowed to believe in whatever the fuck this is um and shouldn't be able to be fired for being quote unquote conservative and then you just allow being conservative in America to mean being someone who hates Jewish people. Yeah, and it's it's super fucked up. It distorts our politics in so many ways. And it's just like on the face of it, like if you were actually to try to break down like the history of American conservative conservatism, like what is the conservative like tenets of conservative belief and like it would be things like, you know, um, uh, like let, let's let's just give one example would be freedom of markets and capitalism and that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Are you really trying to tell me that Disney doesn't want conservatives? Disney. Yeah. Disney 
Disney is anti-conservative. Are you really? Really? You're trying to tell me that Disney, which was founded by one of the single most famous conservatives in the history of Hollywood. No, the single most famous conservative in the history of Hollywood, Walt Disney. Really? They don't want to they don't want to work with conservatives. Maybe your framing is off. You know? Yeah. Like the notion that Disney is like this bastion of leftist politics is like the most hilarious fucking crazy idea to me. It's like the thing that is like destroying and consuming all of America because it is so good at playing the game of capitalism. Yeah. Like, and I just... And then you bring in the, the fucking blacklist analogy, and I need people to understand how offensive that is. Like, people's lives were ruined by the blacklist. We... And not just the blacklist, but the entire Red Scare period that, that Arthur Miller's The Crucible is about. And I know y'all have read The Fucking Crucible because it's in the fucking middle school curriculum, you know? Or high school, I guess. But, like... You know, this was a real thing that happened to people. Lives were destroyed. Like, we... It was one of the most serious infringements on basic, like, human rights in American history. You know? Like, like it is a time when the American government wiped their ass with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and were jailing people for free speech violations. You know? And here's the thing. If Gina Carano had said those things... And then she were called in front of a House subcommittee and put in jail for them. That would be wrong. Yes. That would be really fucked up. And I would be mad about that, even though I find what she said disgusting. But that's not what happened. That's just so fundamentally not what happened. And we could all agree that that would be fucked up. But that's not anywhere near what happened. And even if you ignore the government part of the blacklist, the really important part of the blacklist, the thing where the blacklist gets its name from, is the idea of all the studios getting together and signing and then publishing in the New York Times a formal statement saying we will not hire people of this political persuasion. That is not what has happened. Disney and Warner Brothers and Paramount have not gotten in a room and said we are no longer hiring Republicans. That is not what they have done. This is a isolated case of one woman sinking her own career very consciously by posting idiotic stuff online. That is a different thing. And have there been other situations like it? Yeah, but it is not like a concerted effort. It's a pattern of people who have done really awful shit, <laughs> losing their jobs for doing awful shit. And just at a certain point, like... People need to understand what free speech actually actually means. They need to understand um, the role the government plays in this versus private industry. There are just so many layers to this, and it is just to me like when I see again, like like Chris Hayes is a guy I really respect. He's one of the only news programs I actually regularly listen to. He uh, has been by far the best reporter on any major network on coronavirus. So I have been listening to him a lot in the last year. Chris Hayes is too smart to make this stupid fucking point on Twitter. And yet he is making it because it's like the dumb liberal group think of like, this is how we get our brownie points for both sidesism. I don't know. But it's like, maybe before you make the post about the blacklist, Google the blacklist, read for five minutes, go, wait, we deported Charlie Chaplin? Maybe this isn't comparable. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's it's madness because because really like fundamentally what has happened with Gina Carano is not different than like, if you or I, Jonathan, went into our places of employment and just started spouting fucking anti-Semitic horseshit, right, just publicly to everyone that can hear us, and then us getting fired, which is what you would expect, right? Like, if you went <laughs> yes. to fucking Target and the cashier just all of a sudden just started shouting the N-word at people, right? You'd expect <laughs> that person not to be employed there anymore because that's what happens, right? That's yes. what happens when you are like a... That is, that, or at least it should be what happens when you are like a violent racist in public um, at your place of employment. Like, that's what should happen to you. Uh, you should be fired. This is what happened to Gina Carano. Like, it is, it is a good thing. And it is, not, it is not equivalent to, as you say, Jonathan, like the government... Like, it's not equivalent to either private industry colluding with every other, like, major, uh, like, business in that private industry to make, like, a concerted specific effort, which is, like, one degree. And it's certainly very far away from the government itself violating its own, like, tenets that it's supposed to abide by, which America never has, but violating those tenets, like, very, like, flagrantly um, in arresting or deposing people or, I mean, fucking as you say, ruining people's lives um, and pitting them against each other um, as like an official government action. That's a very, very different thing than someone just being fired from their job for being a racist piece of shit. Yeah. 
And it's just, you know, read your history books, think for five seconds, use critical thinking. Conservatives are not outlined in, in, in Hollywood. Clint Eastwood can make a movie whenever the hell he wants. And Clint Eastwood is pretty out there with his conservative opinions. You remember the chair thing in 2012? I remember the chair thing. It was weird. It but was you know weird, Clint... but it seems so quaint compared yes. to modern politics with the Republican Party. I, but... I would love for the chair thing to be the most out there thing the Republican Party did. I know, I know. But, but Clint Eastwood has not gone out there and like fundamentally disrespected people verbally over and over again. And so he works whenever the hell he wants. And since the chair thing, Sean, I looked this up, he's made nine movies... One of them was American Sniper, which got like 10 Oscar nominations and made like half a billion dollars. So no, there is not a problem with being conservative in Hollywood. There is a problem in America with conflating racism and hate with one political party, which that political party has invited, but then also conflating that with a underlying political ideology and then assuming that it's okay because it's part of a political ideology. And I don't know... Maybe ask Angela Merkel how that worked out for her country. Because I'm sure, like, there are people in uh, in countries who've actually been through this shit who could tell you, like, no, it's actually really dangerous to go down that path of just assuming hate is part of, like, free speech and just allowing it. I'm not saying Angela Merkel had a part in that. I'm saying she's a really smart, thoughtful leader of the world who has, like, foregrounded her country's sins and tried to overcome them. That's my point. Anyway, uh, this really pissed me off, Sean. As well it should have. Yeah. And uh, hey, we did got to do a little film history. There are, you know, there are a couple of things I feel like should be taught as regular history, not just film history. The Blacklist is one of them. Birth of a Nation is one of them. Um, I, World War II and propaganda in general, obviously, is one of them that everyone should know. People should know the like propaganda tactics of triumph of a will of of the will, so that when you see, you know, Batman beating a tire with a hammer in Batman v Superman, you go, "Ugh, that." Why is there Nazi imagery in my Batman movie? And why is it not the villain? You know, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, we should just have an, an American history class that is just called, like, America's Sins. And it should just be, like, that's all the class does is, like, let's look at all the ways that America has, like, ruined itself, the people who live there, um, people who live in other places of the world, um, and has, like, you know, constantly violated the, the tenets that it, it has espoused since its moment of creation. I would just settle for us teaching 20th century American history in schools because we usually like cut off around like World War II and we don't mention Japanese internment and then we don't get into like the Cold War in Vietnam and Reagan and all this like horrible shit. Um, and we just make history seem very... No, where we usually end is civil rights because Martin Luther King Jr. fixed everything and America is magic and unicorns now. Yeah, after uh, MLK, it's just utopia land, right? That's, what's, yeah. that's what American history is. Don't, don't talk about what happened to MLK, though. It complicates the story. No, yeah. Let's not talk about the FBI. <sighs> yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. The FBI fucking I. Anyway, so I know this is a more political topic than maybe we usually get into here, but I had to get it off my chest. Fuck everything. You know what's good, though? What? Genshin Impact. Genshin Impact is good. Let's let's try to end on a high note, Sean. Genshin Impact is good. Uh, I have been watching uh, the anime Death Note. I've been rewatching it for the first time in many years because I got the Blu-ray set. That show's great. Love that show. Uh, I've been having fun with that. We're going to be doing more Gundam soon. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I know we, we keep on getting questions from different avenues about what is the next Gundam thing we're doing. And so we are doing um, the Zeta Gundam movie trilogy. I know we said that at the end of the last weekly season yes. Gundam. But... So we're, and we're doing gonna... that before we move on to double O. Yeah. And do you want to do that next week? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I, I have all my movies ready. Okay. I'm very excited to, to get back to good good stuff like Gundam. Yes. So next week we will be doing uh, Zeta Gundam, a new translation of the movie trilogy on Weekly Suit Gundam. It will also be here on the Weekly Stuff podcast. Uh, if you are a Gundam listener, listen into that episode, both because it'll be fun and we will be also talking about the future of the series uh, in good ways. There's actually going to be more of it coming to you because of how we're going to be covering the next couple series. Um, so we have lots to talk about. Um, and hopefully we won't have to talk about Gina Carano or The Blacklist or Joss Whedon at all. Maybe ever again. That'd be great. And in the meantime, I got to get on to Genshin and make a bunch of those lanterns. <laughs>